the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God must challenge you if you desire for him to change you. You want to hear that one for a second? The Holy Spirit must challenge you in order to change you. All right? And that's a heart of God. Like when we want to be changed, what does that mean? Well, the biblical word for that is sanctification, meaning to be more like Jesus. Right? We want to be able to think more with his thoughts and, and react and, and, and live more according to God's will, more looking like Christ a lot. Like that's what we want to do, but you and I can't do that alone. It's the Holy Spirit of God that allows us to be more in line with God's word and God's ways. And so, but for the Holy Spirit to change us in that way, you got to be willing to be challenged, right? And that's the hard part with all of us. Let's be real, everybody. Online, I know it can see you. Listen. Everybody wants things to be better, but no one wants to do anything different, right? We all want things to be better in life. We want our marriages to be better, the country to be better, our finances to be better, our life, our spirituality to be better. We want everything to be better, but we don't want to do anything different, right? And that's the hard part. And so, guys, I know because I've talked to a lot of you over the last couple of weeks, and you guys have felt attacked, all right? You felt attacked after leaving some of these messages as we've been talking about because we were challenging certain elements of, hey, let's, let, let me challenge an aspect of, of what all these Pentecost moments have been. If you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks, it's not going to make sense. You know, last week we challenged you on prayer, right? And making sure this is what prayer is and ought to be. And I wanted you to reflect. And so for a lot of times I'm seeing the light bulbs and I'm seeing the conversations. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all right. I didn't. I didn't know that. I was like, I didn't realize that maybe some of my prayers were uh, more, uh, you know, they didn't, not scriptural, but more traditional. But then I know that's the scary part. And this is why no one likes to be challenged. Because once you say, if I was kind of wrong about this, then what else am I wrong about? And then now you go into this crazy black hole. And uh, my prayer is that today you leave a little bit um, better. All right, because that's my, my goal. My challenge is not to mess with your lives and just leave you in a, in a wake of carnage and wreckage. I don't want to do that, all right? But if the Holy Spirit is challenging you, let me encourage you, what if it's he wants to continue to change you? Because maybe there's some things, and I know it, me too, guys. There's a lot of things that he challenges me. I'm like saying, all right, look, this thing, chuck that, in order to kind of like refine what I know about God. And that's the thing that I want you to know. Even the things that we declare today, guys, you can know something, but you and I do not fully know it. The, all right, is God love? Yes. What does that mean? I don't care however you respond it, you are failing at describing the love of God and him, him as love. And so this is sometimes there's truth that we need to hold our nose in and go even further in and not and not settle because our, our our tendency guys even as believers but our tendency as people is to find a comfortable level and coast be comfortable and coast but if you really want to see God do a work in you and through you you have to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable all right and so y'all ready keep going all right, because I'm going I'm to challenge some of y'all's uh, perception on worship today, which we just did. But, but uh, guys, my, my biggest thing is that, listen, now when you challenge, the enemy wants to take advantage of your confusion, right? And then this is where there's two paths that, one, I want you to avoid, one, I want you to do. Um, there's a lot of Christians and people, this is a, a term, all right? If you haven't heard it, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. There's a, a, a negative term out there called deconstruction. I say it negative because I'm going to tell you why. Deconstruction is something that happens. In Christian circles, I mean, there are podcasts and books. I mean, it is, it's, it's like the hot thing right now, okay? It's really hot in, in, in Christian worlds, deconstructing. And so all deconstructing is is people who grew up in the faith, grew up with a knowledge or understanding of God, they get confronted with something, and then they say, wait a minute. If I, I guess I was wrong, but I grew up in this way, always knowing this. And so if I'm wrong about this, what else am I wrong about? And then they open up Pandora's box in the negative way, and then they start being critical of everything, to the point that they deconstruct their faith and then construct a faith that is no longer biblical or sound. That's the dangers of going on this deconstructing mode. You gotta be careful. That's not my goal for you. That's not my heart. I had somebody who asked me, is Pastor Tito deconstructing? Nah, bro. Okay, that's not it at all. Because you know when you are, if your love for the Lord 
if you're looking less and less and loving less and less like Jesus, that's a little bit. And when there's like traditional things that we've known to be true and confirmed to be true for generations, and you're like now doing something new, nah, be careful with that. But the thing is, is that deconstructing and sanctification sometimes look like the same thing. I think it was uh, Calvin just mentioned to me, one of our brothers uh, on Wednesday, he, he brought up this analogy of uh, Tylenol and cyanide look the same. They're both white pills. Um, one will kill you, one will help you, right? And so deconstructing and sanctification are the same thing. Sanctification is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Sanctification, sancti, that's the word holy. It is to be more like God. And in order for us to grow and become more like God, God is going to challenge us to stop doing the things that are anti him. Does that make sense? And so, hey, the, the, your understanding may be good, but let's mature in that. Let's grow in that. And so sometimes you need to question. And it's okay to ask honest and sincere questions. The reason I say deconstructing is a negative term, guys, is because deconstructing actually has roots in uh, socialist, Marxist, critical race theory. And it's uh, the fruits are bad because the roots are rotten. And so that's why I, I want to warn you if you see anything like that. But again, deconstructing and sanctification start out with the same thing being challenged. One ends you, one takes you further away from God. The other one becomes more like God. And this is why we all need humble hearts and a good community. It's very important. So my goal is that's what happens to you. So today we are going to look and examine what revival looks like and what worship looks like and what true revival looks like in a way that is continual and how you can fuel that. And we're going to do it by picking up where we left off in our continual journey of through the book of Acts. And so we're going to read Acts 19, and we're going to read 21 through 41. We're going to read it straight, all right? Because I want you to catch this narrative and get this big idea. So, so far we've been talking about Ephesus, what God has been doing in that city over 2,000 years ago. This is the third installment of some details. And even though we've only read um, about a chapter and a half, it's been about almost three years the time frame has been about three years that God has been doing something through Paul in Ephesus. So let's read, starting in verse 21, let's read it all together. Online, we got you. Everybody, if you don't have your Bible, here we go. After these events, which is the events that we talked about last week, and again, it's been about two to three years now, Paul resolved by the Spirit. So Holy Spirit was moving on his life. He prayed about it. He tested the spirits to confirm, is this God? Is this not? And he came to the conclusion with other believers, okay, this is what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. So he was going to leave Ephesus to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem. That's an interesting thing, guys, because Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, also wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke. And Luke climaxes with Jesus going to Jerusalem. And the book of Acts finishes with Paul going to Rome. Uh, and that's where he's going to mention now. He's going to go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he says, it is necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending uh, to Macedonia two of his assistants who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. There's Paul again, bro. Paul, for him, the Christian life is always a team sport, never solo, always a team sport. Verse 23, about this time when Paul was leaving, making preparations to leave, there was a major disturbance, a riot, okay, about the way. The way was the Christian term. It was a name to describe Christians back in, in the time. The first word to describe this movement was called followers of the way. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business of the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded, and look at his word, misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. First off, the irony of that sentence, right? If a god can be made by hand, then how is that a god? And doesn't that mean you're a god? That's a pretty cool superpower to make gods by your hands. And so that look at just the, the irony and just the silliness of that statement. So uh, this guy's saying that just because we make gods with our hands, they're not real gods. Verse 27, not only he continues, um, Demetrius is going off for the spiel. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, so who's he really caring about? That God or his money? Well, he's caring about his money. That's his God. But also that the great temple 
of Artemis, the goddess Artemis may be, it's going to be despised. And her magnificence comes to the verge of ruin, the very one of all of Asia and the world worships. Guys, our all-powerful goddess, she's in trouble and she needs help. Okay, that's literally what, look at the, 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 the phrasing there. Oh, and by the way, the temple of Artemis was considered to be one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. This thing was gorgeous, insane engineering. That's a cool one to look up to later. That's an important detail. And so finally, after his response, what happens? When they, the crowd, heard this, they were filled with rage and they began to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with what word? Confusion. And they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus. These two are Christians uh, that are left behind, Christian leaders there. Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Bro, I'm telling you, Paul had a crew. Paul, and we all need the right crew with us. Although Paul wanted to go in, in before the temple, the disciples did not let them. They were afraid something bad was going to happen to Paul. Even so, look at this. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia who were his, what does that word say, guys? Friends. Sent word to him, pleading him not to venture into the amphitheater. Guys, these officials were friends, and some believe not believers. Look at the relationship that Paul had and his influence that even secular government officials were like, listen, Paul, I don't know what you, you know, you kind of believe in all kind of weird stuff, but you know what, bro? We're buddies, we're friends. There is some, there's positive things happening through your life. I may not believe it, but hey, I see it. And so, guys, wouldn't that be awesome? I want to encourage you, if you don't have uh, non, you all need a crew, tight crew, your inner circle needs to be people who are going to help you in the faith. But hey, you don't, you don't cut off anybody else. Look at Paul. Paul had some, that, those friends, they loved him. That's interesting. All right. So they don't let him go. Some were shouting, verse 23, 32, some were shouting one thing and some another. Because the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not even know why they came together. Guys, you know what that sounds like? The internet, all right? It's like today when we wake up, it's like, all right, guys, what are we going to rage about today? Right? That's how everybody wakes up on Twitter. Guys, what are we going to rage about today? Let's go. And then we're all saying all this nonsense. Wait, what are we even doing? Oh, no, this is fun. You know? That's what's going on here. Everyone's raging and no one knows what's going on. They don't even know why they're there. Verse 33. So some Jews in the crowd give instructions to Alexander and they push him in front of everyone. Motioning with his hands, Alexander wants to make his defense to the people. But they recognize that he was a Jew and they all shouted in unison for two hours. Great is Artemis to the Ephesians. Great is Artemis to the Ephesians. Guys, this Alexander was not a believer, many um, say. He was just a Jew because there was a lot of confusion between, wait, are Jews Christians? Are all Christian Jews? Because of this Jesus was a Jew. And so, in essence, Alexander was like, guys, 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 look, 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 look. We're not on that team. We're not, we're not, but we're not Christians. And they're like, he's a Jew. Shut up. Get him. And so, very little anti-Semitic. But, I mean, Alexander wanted to throw the Christians under the bus. He wanted to disassociate himself and the Jews from it. But guys, the, the, you know, the, the mob was raging. And so here's what happens. They, uh, they, they're chanting for two straight hours. Verse 35. Then the city clerk, some considered to be the most highest ranking official in this town, he calmed the crowd down and said, people of Ephesus, what person, what person is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis? And the image that fell from heaven. See, guys, there was something in legend that something had fallen, maybe a meteor, a rock, I don't know, or something. Maybe somebody tripped over something. I'm like, oh, look what fell from the sky. We don't know. But he is taking them and saying, guys, you remember our faith. Our faith is rooted. Our faith is rooted not only in this great Artemis, but our our faith is rooted in something in the past. This image that fell from the sky. This confirms our faith and affirms our faith. Christians, we do the same thing, don't we? We look to the past. And we look at the cross and the empty grave to affirm our faith today. So that's all he's doing. He's looking to the past, according to legend and folklore, to affirm their faith today. So therefore, guys, listen, therefore, since these things are, look at the words, undeniable. You must keep calm. Don't do anything rash. I'm like saying, guys, come on now. Calm down, calm down. You have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. 
So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him, if they have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and there, there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give a reason for this disturbance. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Again, this would probably have been something if you jumped into it on a morning devotional, you'd be like, great, out of all weeks. I really needed to hear from God today. And that's the thing that I got on my morning Devo. All right, I'm just going to go to John 3.16 and move on for the day. But guys, that's what I'm telling you. There's some beauty in this phrase. And again, Luke is not, Luke and the Holy Spirit doesn't mess around. This is one of the most detailed accounts of what happened in Ephesus. I wonder why. There has to be something why there. Because we've covered some things and it's been short. But when there is details, guys, let me just give you a good, um, this is a bonus. Every time you're reading the Bible and you're reading it straight through and you catch a story where it feels like the author is slowing down by giving you details, that's a sign from the Holy Spirit saying, slow down, there's something here. Y'all following me? Slow down. When you see a narrative really expanded, that means that there's something to be seen. Now, I love that the end of like, hey, we can't charge these Christians with nothing. They've done nothing, right? Same thing, guys. Listen, we have accusers. The devil himself, the scripture says, stands before God accusing us. But there is Jesus saying, uh, no, it's covered. I got it. Blood covered. Done. They're fine. And so, guys, I love that, that reminder. And here, the reason why they had to get, get rid of it, because Rome didn't play games. If you rioted, Rome came through, and they brought the hammer down, because if Rome loved anything, they loved peace, okay? They didn't want to mess with anything else. And so they were like, guys, we need to calm down, because if we really do this and we kind of go after, we could lose our freedom. And so they're like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, let's, let's, let's figure this out. Let's go another way. But so with that, guys, what can we see here? All right, first off, what do we see? We see the ramification and the result of the Ephesian revival that has led to a reformation. Guys, I want you to know that, and this is in Christian circles, we, we love that word, don't we? Right? We love revival. We pray for it. We ask for it. We seek it. We have revival meetings and tent meetings and revival prayer stuff. What does that mean? Revival just to me, means to be revived. That's all that means, okay? And so revival is a good thing. But we got to be careful because there's a, it's very easy for revival to be an idol. Revival becomes an idol when all we're doing is running around chasing spiritual highs and feelings like spiritual junkies. Okay? We try to live our life on the mountaintops and we don't want to go down to the valleys. You, know, you bring the experience of the mountaintop into the valleys, but, but you got to be careful, guys, with that. Because, see, a lot of times, you know, revival usually, biblical revival is never these, like, fireworks. Like, just... <laughs> and bah, all this show and then gone. True revival does not happen in quick spurts. Revival actually is something that starts and lingers over time. True revival always leads to reformation. True revival always leads to reformation. By the way, if you ever, the day that you believed in Jesus Christ was your revival day. And if you are not the same since that moment, you know what happened? You experienced a reformation, right? So true biblical revival leads to reformation and that's what we see here right look at this guys this is an amazing detail that we see everyone demetrius was one he was a leader everyone is upset why because what god was doing not only in ephesus but in the world was a threat to their political economic religious and social traditions man i mean literally the kingdom of god was just they were just you know kicking butt taking names all right and it was altering everything. And they were like, guys, well, we're going to lose our business. We're going to lose our culture. We're going to lose this. We're going to lose that. And, and, and that's the hard part is a lot of times we look and see, well, well we need revival. And so what we look to, we, we put the cart before the horse. And we try to, we want revival on, you know, uh, like, you know, the, the quick stuff, right? The shortcuts. And, you know, let's say we want revival in a nation. And so we got to make sure we get political, you know, political people in there that are believers in Jesus. Should we as Christians? Yes. But, you know, I've heard it said many times, revival doesn't start in the White House. It starts in your house. It starts in the church house first. Then it starts in your house. But the point of revival is not to take over a country neither, guys. Listen, as Christians, our priority is not a country. Our priority is a kingdom. It's a kingdom that goes beyond a country, goes beyond borders. It's different. 
And so, but I love this. So how do you see it? And guys, this is the, uh, the epitome of true revival. True revival is always a grassroots movement. It is something that God does from the bottom up, never top down, always from the bottom up. And it starts with the people of God and the house of God. It always starts there. And so the sanctification that is happening, guys, look at the beauty of the immensity of what God did. I mean, Demetrius is like, guys, this isn't just happening in our town. This is happening all over the continent, without internet, without phones, without, I mean, right, these guys got not even horse and buggy. Some of these, they got to walk. I mean, it's amazing to see the impact that God is having in such a short amount of time with the lack of technology compared to we have. This is a miracle of God. And so we see the sanctification as people are no longer buying these temple artifacts. They are no longer doing certain things. There's a new way about them actually love that, right? Look at that. Like, the, why were Christians called people of the way? Because, first off, they would preach about a way. They would say that there's an, uh, our Jesus, our God says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And there no one can go to the Father but by him. Jesus made a way for us to be forgiven and saved and restored back to God. And so they were called people of the way because they always talked about a way. But they were also people of the way because there was a way about them. There was a way of talking and living and, and acting that was unnatural. It was unlike anything that people are used to. There, here's rich and poor, loving, hanging out together, building relations with each other. Here's people who were former political rivals and now they're friends and they're called each other brother, sister. Here's the people that are not staying in their cultural boxes. They're breaking and now there's a new group that they're making of everyone. What is this? They were confused. And so the thing is, guys, this is a beautiful thing. We see revival leading to amazing reformation. But here's the thing. Not only does God have a way and we as Christians are supposed to have a way, the enemy and our flesh has their own way and they don't like God's way. And so we see it here, right? We see Demetrius and all these guys are upset because our way of life is being threatened, right? And that's the thing, guys, when the Holy Spirit wants to change you and challenge you, every time, every time we see when, when, some, when God is brewing something and God is doing something, not only will there be opposition on the outside, but there's also this opposition on the inside called the flesh. When, God, when the Holy Spirit wants to lead you guys and to say, I want you to walk more into the light. There's a part of us called the flesh that wants to just be stubborn as all can be. And be like, no, I don't want to go that way. You know, I don't want to go that way. And he wants to fight and stay in the dark. And so there's this challenge. This is why so many of us maybe can be confused. Right? Did you see what was, the, what was happening in this whole city? Everybody was confused. Why was everyone confused? Because of overload, right? Everyone was just raging. Everybody was just emotional. And guys, that's, that's, a, that's an important thing there. Our emotions matter. But you know what? We are called to walk by faith, not by sight, as Christians say, and as the Bible says. And so when we walk by faith, meaning we got to tell our feelings to get in line. All right? There's some that, you know, want to, like, suppress all feelings and don't have feelings. No, no, no. Because all feelings can lead you to sin. Yeah, true. So can a lot of other things. But here's the thing. When we walk by faith, it means that we got to allow even our not only our thoughts, but learning to disciple even our own feelings to be, and it won't be perfect, but that's part of it. And, and the enemy loves us. When we're emotional, we tend to be irrational, right? I mean, anybody right there? When you're emotional, you tend to be irrational. That's what's happening here. And then the enemy loves, if he can get you to be emotional, you know what? Now it's easy to confuse you. If you're emotional, now he can confuse you. And so, guys, confusion never comes from God. Confusion is always a purpose of the work of the enemy. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit can cause you to be confused, but he challenges you like saying, wait, wait a minute. So what do you do? Pray, Lord, help me to understand. And he'll help you. He'll help you. Now, it's up to you. If you still remain confused, that's because now you're, you know what? You're hard-headed now. Okay, that's not his fault. That's you. All right, that's you. But so here we see this confusion raging because of overload. And guys, I know I, we see it in Scripture. We see it here and we see it play out in, in reality. The Holy Spirit, I mean, no, not the Holy Spirit, the wrong spirit. The devil loves to confuse people by over-information, overload. You get too much, too much stuff. You don't even, you can't even tell what's up or down anymore. And so this is why it's so important for us to be grounded in the truth and grounded in there. Because sometimes the enemy won't want to throw so much that we can't even make sense of it. 
I think that's what a lot of us have experienced the last couple of weeks. And uh, when there's progress, the, the, Holy, the, the enemy wants to stop the Holy Spirit's progress by getting us to slow down because we're confused, we're doubting, we're wondering, oh my gosh, what's going on? And so here's what we're seeing, but it didn't matter. And um, it didn't, you know, for these two years and even past this, we see the Ephesians continue to persevere in the faith despite the opposition. And guys, that is something that you and I ought to model what, right here. I mean, this is something that what began a couple of weeks ago that we discussed has been consistently growing and going for almost three years. You know what that means? That these, this church, these Christians were modeling the perseverance of the faith. And they were doing it, guys, by seeking a kind of revival that led to a reforming life. A revival that seeks a reforming life. Originally, I wrote reformed life, and I, I didn't like that. Because reformed means done, right? But really, the reality, guys, is all of us, we're supposed to be lifelong learners. If you call yourself a Christian, that means you ought to be a disciple. And a disciple means a lifelong learner. None of us, not me, not you, not you, I see you, none of us, all right, can ever get to a place in this world, in this life, where we're like, you know what, I think I'm done, all right, I've got it all, figured it out, I can coast from here. No, we are called to constantly be learning. And so that's why I changed the word to reforming life. We constantly seek a revival that produces a reforming life. That means to be continually filled. How do we do that? If to be filled by God means, guys, you got to empty yourself. Right? In order to be filled with something, you got to empty out something first. Right? And so, like, you know, this morning I had, uh, I had a cup of coffee. Well, I, I didn't have I got my mug that I drink out of. And I still had some coffee residue. And I wanted to make tea. And so before I filled it up with tea, I needed to, right, wash it out, empty it out, make sure the soap is out. That's disgusting. I've done that, too. You know, trying to quick rinses and like, all right, you just feel the dawn. And I wasn't, that's not good. And so I made sure to get it out. And then that's the same thing, guys. And so if we want the Holy Spirit to fill us, then we need to give him space. And how do you give God space? By repenting and renouncing. That's all it is. Repenting is just saying, all right, God, my bad. You're wrong. I'm, I'm wrong. You're right. That's all that means. I'm wrong. You're right. And so help me to come inside. And so we give him space for that. But even that term, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even that term can be triggering to some people. And it's caused a lot of confusion because there's an overload. Again, I, I am convinced, convinced, seeing, seeing through scriptures, even in this example right here, right? There, there's not a lot of, there's some confusion about God the Father. There's some confusion about God the Son. There is a ton of confusion about God the Holy Spirit. Why? Overload of information. And it causes confusion. And a lot of times, there's a lot of people spitting stuff out that they don't know what they're saying. And, you know, and, and some do, but it all sounds good. And so it kind of feels good sometimes. And so what do you do? And why is there so much confusion about the role of the Holy Spirit, guys? Because it's God in you that the enemy can't do anything about. And so this is why he wanted to make sure confused at all. So, so when we hear, when you hear, I would love to even ask this question back and forth, but we've got time. When you think you got to be constantly filled with the Spirit, what does that mean? For some people, it can mean that. For some people, it just means that, you know, you, you're like super saying up, you know, like you're just kind of leveling up at that moment. And, and to be filled with the Spirit means I got to spend all this time in either prayer so God can do supernatural things in me. Can he? We've been talking about that. But what does it mean at its core? And, and when we look, when we look at terms, guys, like the, when God uses an inspired words in the Bible that says, be filled with the Spirit, let God define himself. Y'all tracking? Let God define himself. So Paul writes to the same Ephesian church. He had left later on and he wrote a letter to the Ephesians. And in it, he tells them, be filled with the Spirit. So let's look at the definition. What was he implying when he says that? Last week, if you missed it, I told you guys about the armor of God that he talks about the Ephesian church. And a lot of times we look at the armor and we say, okay, what does is, what is a shield tell me about faith? And what does a helmet tell me about salvation? When guys, if you read the whole letter of the Ephesians, He's been talking about peace and salvation and unity and the gospel and the spirit and righteousness and faith. He's been talking about it the whole time. So don't look at the armor to tell you what it means. Look at everything else he's been saying because he's defining it. He uses the illustration to kind of cap it. But you don't start there. No, read the whole letter and you'll see. If you read the whole letter to the Ephesians, it's one whole letter about what that means. And so here is a layer of it. 
he talks about being filled with the Spirit. Well, let's look at when he says being filled, what are some things? So let's read Ephesians chapter 8. Look at this. Uh, you got on, wait, you only got 19, right, Mateo? All right, no, hold on a second. You only got 19 and 20. So before you put that up, actually, give me a second. So in Ephesians, guys, he actually talks a lot and uses that word filling a ton before he mentions the word be filled with the Spirit. In chapter 1, verse, where am I, 23, he describes Jesus as the fullness of God who fills all in all. So Jesus is the one who fills. He is the one who fills us, all right? And he wants to fill and fulfill all things. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. I might be going fast, and so if you want this, you can catch me out later. Or just, hey, online, just rewind, all right? You can do that later too. He later then says in chapter 3, he says that you may know the, the love of God, that you may know the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God, that you may be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. So there it is again, that you may be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. Jesus is the one who fills all in all. And may you allow Jesus to fill you with the fullness of God. And what does it mean to be filled? He says that you may know the love of God, that you may be filled continually with a greater understanding of the love of God. But he's not done. In chapter 4, in chapter 4, 10, he says, be filled. God fills the whole universe and he is doing something outside, all over the place. In verse 13 of chapter 4, he says that we are to mature in the faith to the fullness of Christ. So there it is again. So to be filled by God and to be filled with the knowledge of God is to be filled to become more like Jesus. That's called sanctification. And so what, is, what does it mean to be filled? What is the end, end game and purpose of being filled? And then in chapter 5, he uses the phrase again. And he talks about light and darkness. And like, guys, we got to expose darkness. Don't walk in it. Expose it. Walk in the light. And he does this duality about light and darkness, being light, being God's truth, darkness, being everything else. And then he culminates with this light and dark. Don't be foolish into the dark. Be wise and walk in the light. And then in, now we can put it up there in verse 19 and 20, no, 18, right? Yep. He says, and, so that means the conversation that he's making prior, and, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. We're going to stop there. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It leads to reckless living. So here's that phrase filled up again. So did, did he just jump out of nowhere and now, hey, we got to talk about some of y'all liquor, liquor consumption real quick. All right. Is the focus on the drink? No, he's using it as an analogy. He's using it as that. Now, there's a good um, warning to that. Because, yes, we all know that kind of excess is not going to lead well. It leads to destroying your life, your liver, everything, right? And so it says it leads to reckless living. And what is reckless living? He was just defining it. Reckless living is living according to the ways of this world. Reckless living is, is living apart from God, apart from him. And so in the same way that when people get drunk and they live all kind of ways, that's what darkness does to you. When you drink darkness, when you drink the lies of the enemy, you are not in the right mind. You're not in your own right mind anymore. And it leads to destructive living. But instead be, what? Filled with the Spirit. This is now why some people say, see, what you need to be is be drunk in the Spirit. Not, see, don't get drunk on wine, but be drunk with the Holy Spirit. And then now there's some, you know, I'm, I'm going to step on toes. And now there's some that say like that. It's like, oh, now we know. Oh, he has the Holy Spirit because he's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now they're, oh, when you start acting drunk, now that's being drunk in the spirit, flag on the play. All right? Is that what he meant? Is that what Paul meant? We're supposed to be out there like, you know what, guys? I love you. Jesus love you so much. <sighs> yeah. This is not a verse that tells you to be drunk with the Holy Spirit that you just can't even control yourself. Fruit of the Spirit is self-control too, so yikes. Guys, he has been saying be filled with the Spirit. What? He's not saying something different. What? He's just saying differently. He's just using a different phrase, but it's the same thing. He, the whole letter, he's like saying, oh, that you may be filled, that you may be filled, that you may be filled with what? With God. Be filled with the Spirit. And then the next chapter says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the truth of God. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the knowledge of Christ. 
It is to know him. It is to fill your mind and your heart and your soul with the nature and character and beauty of God to the point that you are now, in the same way that you drink too much liquor, you are under the influence, that you are consuming the truth of God so much that you are now under the Holy Spirit's influence, not the flesh. This has nothing to do with excessive movements and excessive experiences of the Spirit. This has everything to do with being more like Christ, knowing him and being more like him, walking in his will. It's the same thing. And the Ephesians were doing that very thing. Oh, and by the way, when he says filled with the Spirit, um, it actually is a term that means and be continually. Be continually filled with the Spirit. And so, guys, be careful because a lot of times we think of the Spirit and we think of things like the presence of God. Even, let, let, me, let me mess with you on that one. All right, and so we pray and we sing songs, oh, about the presence, and we just need the presence and the presence and the presence. Do not, do not, my warning now is do not praise and pursue the presence like if it's a feeling. Okay, because listen, God's presence doesn't have to be felt to be effective. I'm going to say it slower. God's presence does not have to be felt to be effective. There's a lot of Christians who we try, like we have to like press through until we, now we're in the presence of God. Now we are. Now? Or did you just kind of work yourself up into a mantra and now you're experiencing some kind of like, you know, nirvana, faux spirituality? Because you just kind of like just, Spiritually, hum, until you get it, and there it is. Be careful. Guys, the presence of God does not have to be felt in order to be effective. Because God says you guys can enter into the very throne room of God. Now, sometimes, sometimes, I ain't gonna lie, sometimes you feel stuff. I'm not saying you can't. But just, there's sometimes it's like, un until we feel it, we know it's not there. No, see. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Because that is not what it means to be filled. This means to be knowing him, to be reflecting him more and more. To be filled is to know Christ, to make him known. It, to be filled with the Spirit, guys, is not to get more of God. Because if you are a believer, you have the fullness of God in you. If you have the, so there's a lot of times he's, oh, we just need to be filled with the Spirit because I need more. I need more power. I need more this. And so it's like you're trying to get more of him. No, you don't get more of God. If you're a Christian, you have all of it. The problem is that he needs to get more of you. That's the problem. Does he have you? And that's where repentance and that's where the, the, the discipleship and obedience comes in. Is does he have more of you? You don't go running and pursuing it to get more. No, you have it all. The thing is, we've been fooled, but we have, we've been fooled. The Holy Spirit has filled us, but, but the, the whole, you know, again, there it is. Look at the confusion that the enemy wants to bring in. No, we have been filled, but too many Christians are fooled to think that it's, it's still out there. I need to get more. I need to get more. No, you need to give more. You need to surrender more to him. And so, and, and it's not going to happen by, listen, there's no shortcuts. The only way it happens is by letting the truth of God in our hearts but let's not be like this kid, because this is not how you know the truth. Can you put the video on? This is not how you know more of the love of God. You open up your... That easy, but it's not to be filled to be filled with the Spirit is to literally look at this. By the way, you know that God's Word is also described as water. It is literally the same thing to be filled and to drink. And he says, don't be drunk on wine and don't be drunk on the lies of this one. No, but drink up the truth of God. Drink of God's Word. Drink of who He is. Drink that up. Get it in you. And, that, and the other way, and so obviously, you know, it doesn't, not through osmosis. It doesn't happen through osmosis. This is why you got to ask questions. You got to learn to, Lord, challenge me. Guys, you understand that the Bible is the only book that not only that you read, but the Bible reads you. You read it, but it also reads you if you let it. And you got to linger long enough. It's not going to happen on a three-second three second devotional in the morning before you got to go work. It doesn't work like that. And so, by the way, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop because Paul didn't. When he says be filled with the Spirit, 
he did not stop there. And so you would think, oh, well, to be filled with the Spirit is, do you know how I know it's truth? Because Paul said it. Just keep reading, yo. I mean, we literally read things in such compartmentalized ways. We forget that, hey, there's more to a sentence. So let's look at the rest of the sentence. My there, you can put it up. He says, be filled with the Spirit, and then explains how. In verse, uh, what was it? 19 and 20, he says, speaking, this is how you are filled with the Spirit, speaking and sing, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus, and submitting to one another in the fear of God, and submitting to one another is another way of saying love. Loving one another by submitting to one another. That's a huge theme in Ephesians. He, he's right now going to, after he says submit to one another, he then riffs on husbands and wives, slaves and masters, children and parents. Love one another by submitting yourselves to each other. Guys, how are we filled with the truth of God? When, listen, when we speak the truth of God to each other. When we even sing the truth. That's an important one, but the speaking, let's go there. Guys, how are you filled with the Spirit? By me, I'm doing it right now, guys. I hope, I hope y'all got some buckets because it's splash zone right now, all right? So listen, I am helping you to be filled with the truth. I'm not doing it. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit is helping you to take these truths and understand, oh, this is what he means, and this is what it is, and this is what it looks like, all right? We encourage each other. We are filled with the Spirit the more we speak the truth of God to one another. That's an important one. And the singing is important too. Guys, when we sing, we just did it this morning. Why do we sing songs? Why? Why has the, why has the church since forever? And why are singing and music so related to any world religion? Because when there's a unified sense of singing, all of us are united in the same truth and we're declaring the same things. And you guys know it even scientifically, when you are in corporate singing, Together, there's actual like things that happen. It's positive, mental, emotional things that happen when you are singing. This is why concerts are so powerful. When everyone is singing the same lyrics that the person on stage is, because it's a unified experience. Singing matters. And this is why, guys, we always start with songs. And I always challenge the, the, the band when they lead songs in the morning. I always want them and I challenge them to say, and our, our pastors, my, my dad as well, we say, pick songs that don't focus on our feelings, pick songs that focus on facts. Who is God? Because guys, when we wake up in the morning, right, it's like we, kind of, we can feel all kind of ways, but it's what we know. It's what we know that anchors us. It's not how we feel, it's what we know. And when we sing together, you know what we're doing? We're reminding ourselves of truths of God. We're reminding ourselves. We're opening our hearts and opening our minds and we're declaring the glories of God. And then now we worship with singing, we worship with praying. We worship, we're still worshiping now with speaking. And so this is why I, I, I sent a mass text for some people like saying, hey, warning, I'm going to talk about being on time at church today because this is why. And guys, look, I'm going I'm to be honest, right? If we have a whole service and there's music part, there, it's, a, it's for a reason. And hey, you can be late for time to time. I get that. Please don't make it a habit because you are robbing yourself. You are robbing yourself of, of being and joining with the church of God, declaring truths of God together. All right. And listen, I could care less. I, I got I got I, I got my concerns. But listen, I could I could care less. Oh, and I don't like I don't like the singing and I don't like the song selection. I don't like the music. I don't like the band. I don't like this. It's too loud. It's too quiet. It's too fast. It's too slow. First, of all, I ain't gonna be perfect. All right. But hey, why are we singing? I can care less if you like those things. Sing your guts out about who God is. I can care, all the other stuff is irrelevant. If you need everything to align perfectly on stage for you to connect with God, I'm sorry. Listen, there's been plenty of worship experiences outside, sometimes inside here, that uh, I'm just like, you know what, I don't need it, don't need it. Oh, well, as long as they're not singing out of key and off beat, I'm fine, okay? As long as they're not singing out of key and off beat, sing your guts out to the Lord for all that he is and all that he's done. Feel me? It does that. You, you rob yourself of something when you're like, ah, that's not important. Uh, if it, I'm telling you now, if the singing wasn't important, I would ditch it. I would ditch it. 
But if it's if it is, if we have it, it's because it's important. That is how we're filled with the Spirit when we're speaking to one another, when we're singing together to one another. Even look with our hearts. You know what that means? That's sentiments. There's our emotions. We're bringing even that to the Lord. And then ultimately our service. This is the one. This is not like the other kind, right? Oh, I want to be filled with the Spirit. That's like quick shortcuts for emotional, spiritual highs. No, you are filled with the Spirit. The more you get in God's Word, the more God's Word gets in you, and the more you get out off your butt and start loving somebody. You are filled with the Spirit when you submit yourself to others in love. That is what it looks like to be filled. To be filled has little to do with feelings. It has everything to do with motion moving forward. That's what it is. Now, the feelings can be there. And so this is what fuels, guys. This is what fuels that revival fire. I guarantee you right now, oh, you've been a little cold. You've been a little this. Take one of those things off, and and you're going to feel it in your spirit. Uh, You know, maybe it's less talk. Maybe you're not talking about God anymore. That You're going to feel it. You are going to feel it. You're going to feel far from God. Well, because you're not being filled up with the truth. You're not being reminded. You're not walking in it. The more you're not, you're not serving others and you're serving yourself, that's a quencher right there. That's a quencher right there. And so these things are what it means to be. It's, it is the fuel, guys, that fuels that fire, that revival fire that makes it continual. This doesn't happen. And you can't get all of this in one hour of a service and think, I've checked off all those boxes because we did. I'm good for the week. No, this should be a rhythm of our life. This is the rhythm of your life, not just the rhythm of our day. You know what that's called? That's called liturgy. Liturgy is an order of service. Literally, liturgy literally just means rhythm. So our services have a liturgy. We have a rhythm of singing and speaking and praying and encouraging one another. Why? Because that's a Sunday rhythm that should be our daily rhythm. I, we order, I structure services in a way that we, to be reminders of you on, this is how we live all the time. Praying, singing, worshiping, loving. This is all, this is what it is. And so we need to make sure, guys, we're putting the right fuel in the fire if we want to be filled with the Spirit. And, the, and it's, it's the truth of God. What you want is wood, not cardboard. All right? Now, this is, bon, this, we're getting into bonfire season. All right? Meanwhile, if we love bonfire season over at our house. It's Florida. I know it's hot, but we like to suffer. So um, we like to do bonfires outside at night. We love it. And so I've used wood, and at times I didn't have wood, so I had to use cardboard, all right? Cardboard, it works, but cardboard goes up fast, right? And then you got all the ash, and that's all disgusting. But cardboard works, but it just, boom, it gets consumed really quickly. But when you put wood in there, it takes longer, right? I want to challenge you, like saying, making sure, guys, as, you're, as a Christian, don't use cardboard because you can use spiritual cardboard, and you can feel it. And you think that, okay, I'm, I'm experiencing the, the move of God, the heart of God. It's card. You're seeing fire, but if you're up and down, it's because you're, you're chucking cardboard in the fire instead of wood. And so what does it look like? I would, I'm going to describe it like this. Wood, when you ch- the, the right kind of wood, which we just described it, it's the truth of God. It's living out the truth. It's knowing and applying, pondering and practicing. It's slow cooked. Wood is, this kind of revival fuel is slow cooked. It's sustained over time. It's rooted in a way of living. It's rooted in a way of worship that includes daily prayer, the word, and works. And this kind of wood is others focused. It's others focused. I do these things to love and serve others for their sake. That's what that love is. When you throw that wood in the fire, you got you got revival that maybe you don't feel those highs anymore. But remember, true revival leads to reformation. That's when you know you're in revival is when you're seeing reforming in your life long term. When the service is if the service is over and the music is gone and three days later you're the same person, you didn't hit you didn't hit revival. You hit an you hit an emotional experience. That was not God. That was your feelings. Okay. But you see true revival when it leads to reformation. And so it's slow cooked. It's sustained. It's a way, a rhythm of prayer, word, and works. Fast food, cardboard spirituality, cardboard um, fuel for your fire is like fast food. It's shortcuts. It's spiritual hacks. It's not rooted in a lifestyle, a way of living. It's rooted in a way of feeling. It's not rooted in a way of living. It's rooted in a way of feeling. How I feel. All right? Not what I know, how I feel. Instead of being others-focused, it's self-centered. And it always is determined on how does this make me feel? Now, again, feelings are important. But guys, you never take your experience and you never 
You never interpret truth based on your experience, no matter how powerful it is. You always take the truth of God and you let the truth interpret your experience. That's the safe way to do it. Have your feelings, bring it, but you let God's truth do it. And so this is where, because there's feelings are involved and the Holy Spirit wants to shake you, right? He wants to cha challenge you. And to have that revival that grows into reformation, listen, you want to, it, it's a journey and it's not an easy one, all right? Because there's so many things in us that want to even fight God. And so you got to look at it this way. And, and we've mentioned this before. I've heard it said that the gospel is not the diving board into another pool. Sometimes it's that. It was like, all right, well, we're learning truths about God loves me, this I know. But that's just the diving board. I want to jump into the things of the Spirit. I want to jump into, away from this, into more things, into more power, into this, into that. No, the gospel is not the diving board. The gospel is the pool. The truth of God is the pool. That it's not just a pool, but it's like the ocean, right? I've never been in like out there, out there in the ocean, ocean, deep, deep. But I've been in enough places where I've had to, I couldn't see the bottom. Anybody that just panics right there you're just gonna die right there yeah I, you're you're fine as long as you see your feet am i am i correct anybody that lives in florida you're you're fine in the ocean i'm fine as long as i can see my feet if i can't see my feet i'm backing up all right i need to see my feet all right spiritually we're like that too but here's the thing god is like the ocean but it's different see if you and i were dumped in the middle of the atlantic and i gave you some goggles you can look into you can see underwater and you're going to be able to determine, wow, that's deep. You can recognize there's depth, but you can't see enough to see the bottom, right? You can recognize that there's depth, but you can't, you can't see the bottom. Guys, that is what it looks like to know God, is to peer inside and see, look at the depth of the, not look at the depth of the love of God, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness is so deep, but I can't see the bottom, and you never will. Because that is why he is God. He's God. He is, his love is bottomless. His love, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, all of it is. It is deep and there is no bottom. And so what we need to do is not just, just remain in the surface because the Spirit wants us to go deeper into, not into different things, no, into further understanding who we are. Anything that you may see outside of Scripture, if, it doesn't be, if it's not confirmed in here, chuck it, okay? It has to come down here always and so you gotta you just gotta keep going i can't see the bottom then just be like dory just keep swimming all right literally just keep swimming just keep believing just keep reading just keep singing just keep speaking just keep serving just keep thinking just keep knowing just keep growing just keep loving the more we just do that then the more the holy spirit keeps changing us it keeps changing us we're not in the wrong pool no it's just got to keep going to be filled with the spirit is to do that it is to he empowers us the same way equipment empowers a scuba diver. I've never done that. Anybody ever scuba dive before? I've never gone scuba diving. But what does scuba diving gear do to you? Huh? A scuba diving gear, it empowers someone who's not from the underwater world to operate and function in it. Am I correct? Gear, uh, scuba gear empowers an individual who is not, does not belong, it is not from the underwater world, and it allows them to operate and function in it. We have been given all authority in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit himself. Because when we're believers, Jesus now says, you are no longer of this world. You are no longer of this world. This is not your world anymore. You are made different. But the Holy Spirit allows us and empowers us to be able to operate and function in a world that we are not of. That's what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. That's what truth does. That's what the truth of God does. It allows us to operate and function in a way in this world. In this world that it, we are not of it anymore. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, this is what, when we have authority in Christ Jesus, what does that mean? Because we've talked about it. It doesn't mean that we have the authority of Christ to do anything we want. No, we have all authority to do the will of God. We have all authority to do the will of God. And what is the will of God? To know him and make him known. And the more you dive deeper into God's word, listen, the more you will discern God's will and the more you will do God's will. When moments come up and happen, because I'm telling you, man, if we had all authority to do whatever we wanted, we would have fixed COVID in 10 seconds. We would have fixed COVID in 10 seconds. We would have fixed 9-11 in 10 seconds. If we had all authority to even reverse time and to do this and to do that, 
It's funny because, I mean, I've seen it and we've experienced it where there's moments when we, we're praying even with somebody who's manifesting a demon and we have seen that demon go. And we've also dealt with people that demon don't want to go. The demon don't want to go because that person likes that demon too much. If I had authority, I mean, like, listen, it's stupid. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to cast him out for you because you're too dumb to, you know, you want to hold on to him. Let me help you. You know, I could totally do that. But no, I, we don't have the authority to do that. And there's some people that love the attention of being delivered. They don't want to be free. They just like the attention. If I had authority to fix that, we would. Guys, but we have all authority to do God's will. And authority means permission. And permission means that if we are walking in the light, there's nothing the devil can do about it. There's nothing he can do about it. But then what are we going to do about this? Like, guys, we need to do what the Ephesians did and also be careful what the Ephesians didn't do. And we're going to try to wrap this up in four minutes. What did the Ephesians do? Paul says in Ephesians 1, oh, your great love. You have for your great faith and your great love towards one another. Keep doing it. Keep going. They had a great love for one another. They were experiencing revival. Unfortunately, years later, many years later, they get another letter from another apostle called John. Revelations chapter 2, to the letter of the Ephesians, you've forgotten your first love. They were fueling themselves with the truth of God and the knowledge of God and serving and loving and serving and loving. And at some point, they cared more about being right than doing what was right. Guys, be careful because the more you grow in the knowledge of God, it is very, you, it, you, the more that you grow and the more that you know, it is very cautious, it is very probable that you can be very prideful. And you can be so like, I know what's right, and then you stop loving. And now you don't even do what's right anymore. The love, our first love, guys, is to love God. And how do we express the love of God? By loving others. Loving is truth. So we need to do those very things. It, it, we can go up and down in our movement, in our growth. And so, and again, there's a lot of depth to these things. There's, I wanted to challenge you about prayer and worship and even God using you, spiritual gifts. There's so much depth to this. And I can't go to the bottom for you. I can't. But I can give you one small little handle that hopefully here's the resolution. Here's the one thing that hopefully you guys are, this can anchor you in your confusion. This can anchor you and when you're wondering about things. So you're not deconstructing, but more in sanctification. Here's a simple prayer from Robert Hawker. He was a Puritan from the 1700s. I love this prayer. Pray this prayer this week. Every time you're asking questions, keep this simple. He said, come Holy Spirit and chill my affections to this world and warm them towards Christ. Pray that prayer when you're confused. Pray that prayer when you don't know what else to do. Lord, chill my love for this world and warm my love for you. Because the more God has your affections, your actions follow. Chill my heart towards the things of this world and warm them towards you. God, that is what worship looks like. That's what revive, that is what reforming revival looks like when we constantly pray those things. And I want you to know that despite the opposition, despite the confusion, guys, we don't got nothing to worry about. I know, you know, let, let's A.B. compare Jesus with Artemis. The clerk comes up at the end and says, guys, 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 come on now. We don't got to worry about anything. Look at, look at our goddess. Our goddess has, uh, look at this temple. It is one of the great ancient wonders of the world. There is no temple like it. Where is Jesus' temple? Nowhere. You know, look at this. Look at in the past. We know it is undeniable how great our God is. And so what do they chant all the time? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Guys, we don't got to worry about this Jesus. We got Artemis. Fast forward. Where's Artemis now? Where's that temple now? Gone. Ruins. But where's Jesus? Still on that throne. Still on that throne. If the clerk could say, guys, we ain't got nothing to worry about. 2,000 years gives us proof to say, guys, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about because our king is still on that throne. Because we have nothing to worry, now we should just worship God and declare and grow in understanding great is Jesus of the Christians. Great is our Christ of the believers. Great is our father of our sons and daughters. That's who we are. Great is Christ of the Christians. We have nothing to worry about. All we have to do is continue to submit ourselves, surrender, and he will do the job.